Thank you so much for coming in to interview with us today, President Carter. I will start us off with a question. So when the Lantern spoke with you back in January, you mentioned that you were going to create a written strategy around your 100 day mark, outlining where you intended to take the university in the next three to 10 years. Has the strategy since been developed and are there any concrete aspects of the strategy that you were able to share today? So Lucy, great question. You know, when I started here on uh, January 1st, after being announced on August 22nd, I started already thinking about what will we do to develop the future plan for this great university? So for the first six months, I kind of was in the listen and learn mode. And at the 100 day point, I, I had the opportunity to do the, uh, the state of the university address where I talked a lot about the past, a little bit about the front, uh, where we are, and then looking towards that vision. We're now in the action mode where we're starting to put together the strategy for the future of Ohio State. Uh, I have in the last week and even today been engaging with uh, about a thousand people who have been invited from all different constituencies and going through a workshop, asking them what they value and what are the, the things that we should care about going forward. So uh, you're going to be hearing more about my investiture tomorrow. Uh, we're going to be putting out a special email to the entire campus. We'll announce what date that is. Uh, and it's going to be at that point, we're going to roll out a strategy. And from that strategy, it's going to look out over the next 10 years, going all the way to 2035, uh, centered around the simple idea of how do we become the higher education institution for the nation. Uh, and I'm really excited. This is not the Ted Carter plan. This is the Ohio State University's plan. And uh, we've got an incredible amount of feedback on it already. We are with the student leadership group today. Um, and I've got a few more groups to address, but uh, uh, we're well underway in putting this thing together. All right, and then referencing a conversation that you had with the Lantern in April, you mentioned that the university was weeks away from making a decision in regard to the vice president and provost positions, yet there still have been no announced new hires. So when does the university intend to make a decision around these important positions? So we have been interviewing, and sometimes being a little bit patient will get you the best answer. And uh, we're close. So uh, I would say that uh, within the next 30 days, we'll be making an announcement. Great. So um, President Carter, moving on to the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, a letter concerning Senate Bill 83, a bill that if passed would eliminate requirements for DEI courses and training for students, staff, or faculty, which included signatures from the undergraduate student government and the Ohio Union Activities Board, was sent to you and the Ohio State Office of Government Affairs in early May. The students had concerns over a lack of transparency from the university regarding policy changes related to DEI. So where do you stand on the value of DEI now? Uh, the same place I did when I came here. And I talked about that when I got here. I still feel the same way. Uh, understanding uh, the importance of diversity is something that's important to all of us, to include myself. Uh, and at the end of the day, we want to be the campus that's welcoming. I, I want people, when they come here, to make a decision about whether they want to come here as a student whether you're a faculty member that we're recruiting or we're, whether you're somebody we're trying to retain, I think it's important that everybody can see themselves being here, that they feel comfortable here, they feel safe here, that they know we have the resources to take care of them here. And, and at the end of the day, it's really about student success. We want our students to be successful. So this is an important element. Um, the thing that I have spent a lot of time talking to uh, members of the General Assembly, and by the way, I have been involved in this conversation. I did go testify on behalf of the university to include on Senate Bill 83, as well as our budget issues. I wanted to make sure they understood what we mean when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, a lot of people have a tendency to just go right to thinking about the color of somebody's skin. Yes, that's a part of it, of course, uh, but it's so much more. And ultimately, the power of what it means to be a diverse campus, to be working in a group that's looking to work either towards a common goal, is about how we embrace the diversity of thought. And I'm proud of, I think we have a lot of that here, uh, here at Ohio State. So we're going to continue to cultivate that uh, and embrace those concepts. Um, you know, keeping on this topic, what can you promise to students who are concerned that their education and student activities may be threatened by Senate Bill 83? Well, first of all, I, I'm not a legislator, so I can't determine uh, what will happen in the, in the General Assembly. What I have done is spent a lot of time in the State House working with the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, the heads of the Education Committee, uh, you know, the Senate President, the Speaker of the House. Uh, I've met with the majority of all of the elected officials 
uh, in our state capital. So that's important because I have now access to them and I can engage in that conversation. Uh, Senate Bill 83 did not move, uh, which I think is sometimes forgotten in this. It didn't make it w its way through. And we, as a board of trustees, as a university, had already expressed where we felt on that, and nor did we endorse Senate Bill 83. There will probably be some other version of it written at some point. And all I've asked to do is be engaged in the conversation. Uh, and where I want to make sure is they're not asking us to do something that either A, we're already doing, or something that's going to create another layer of bureaucracy for some sort of administrative review that doesn't necessarily help us with our mission. Uh, you know, I like to think that we do all the things we're supposed to do here in terms of education for citizenship because it's what's good for the state of Ohio, it's good for workforce development, it's good for our students in making them ready to go into the workforce and be those great citizens. So uh, I think that's really important as we look forward to whatever legislation uh, some of the members of the General Assembly feel necessary to write up. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, over the past few weeks, um, the Lantern has been working with Ohio State spokespeople to clarify the university's space standards. More specifically, we have drawn parallels between the April 25th pro-Palestine protest, which resulted in 36 arrests, 16 of which were Ohio State students and subsequent on-campus demonstrations, which include the August 26th Christian baptism ceremony outside of Crow Market. And based on our prior reporting, the distinguishing factor that sets April 25th apart was the organizers and particip participants' attempt to establish an on-campus encampment. With all this being said, we want to know, does violating the tents and temporary structures section of the space standards result in harsher consequences for student activists than violating other sections, such as reserving space for events or time and duration of events? Well, first of all, every event that happens here on campus is gonna be different. And uh, I always defer to not only what we have in our space rules, we review them regularly, we transmit what they are, but uh, the leadership and student life, as well as our campus safety experts, they're the real experts in making sure this happens. And ultimately, two things are important to me. One is that, we uh, endorse and make sure that people know that they have freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Uh, we will always prefer that somebody come talk to us about how they set up their uh, programs or events so they know what the rules are. Um, the second is, is making sure we have everybody safe, and that's a really important aspect here. And that's something that everybody cares about. Now, just since we started the school year, we've already had three events. We've had a Christian prayer vigil, a Jewish prayer vigil, um, and a Muslim prayer vigil, all without incident. Um, the events that you refer back to uh, on April 25th, uh, sadly, the only reason those ended up the way they were is because there was a planned attempt and a clear statement to violate our campus space rules. Uh, there were multiple warnings all the way through the night so that none of those events had to end the way they did. And it was clear at some point there was a group of people there that were not going to leave and wanted to have the encampment. And I really wish that it hadn't ended the way it did. I would have preferred it not. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, as we saw in many campuses across the country, once those encampments started and grew, there was no way to even ensure the safety of those people that were there. Uh, and I did not want to see that happen. Uh, so that's why those events occurred the way they did. Um, so it wasn't about one versus the other. They're completely different events in my view. Um, and we just want to make sure that our students that engage in these activities, basically they know the rules. And when they do come to us, they acknowledge, yes, we understand the rules, uh, but we'll continue to force them as we've laid them out. We've already done another review for our space rules going into this year, and I feel comfortable that we've got it right. So just to clarify one section of these space standards, as more violations of the standards compound, does the university's response to the event grow in scale? No, not necessarily. Again, uh, you know, I'll let the campus safety people along with the student life look at those things. If somebody breaks the rules and there's a real violation, particularly if one opposed to some sort of safety or the attempt to incite violence, then those are going to be reviewed, of course. Yeah. And then on the topic of free speech, um, a year ago the university implemented its campus free speech policy in order to affirm the university's commitment to free speech on campus and align university policies with Ohio law. Prior Lantern reporting from around this time last year 
cites concerns from professors on campus about their rights to free speech being violated. Um, the president of the university's chapter of the American Association of University Professors told The Lantern, um, quote, faculty who are regularly targeted for our speech, I don't think these policies are to protect us. I think, in fact, these policies are happening in a climate where that kind of demonization of certain kinds of speech is actually increasing that targeting of faculty. Um, sim very similarly, under Senate Bill 83, which includes prohibitions of faculty unions striking during contract negotiations and new evaluation evaluations for students to rate professors on how well they've removed bias from their classrooms, how well are you planning to in how are you planning to ensure that faculty are able to practice their First Amendment right to free speech and protest? So Riley, you just gave me a great example of freedom of expression and free speech. That professor expressed himself very, or herself, whoever that is, very clearly, and that's their opinion. Um, there is no state law that is an extension of Senate Bill 83 yet. Uh, so the policies that we have here stay, in fact, and I'll stay true to the fact that I believe everybody has a right to free expression. Kind of going back to, um, you know, more questions about Senate bills. <laughs> but Senate Bill 17, which created an intellectual diversity center here at Ohio State, among other public Ohio institutions, was passed in last year's op state operating budget. And these centers are required to value intellectual diversity, educate students by means of rigorous intellectual inquiry, help students reach their own conclusions of legal, social, and political matters, and welcome differences of opinion. One of the bill's sponsors, Jerry Serino, uh, views this as an effort to combat overwhelming liberal thought at Ohio universities. Uh, Ohio State was allocated $5 million each fiscal year for the growth of this center. So, you know, why does Ohio State support the creation of the center? Why do you see it as valuable? Well, first of all, I think all opinions, all different types of voices uh, are something that we should welcome. We should have a diversity of thought, a diversity of conversation here. I, I like the idea that we are creating the, the Salmon P. Chase uh, Center uh, as a place that can understand better uh, the, the tenets of civics, the tenets of free speech, the tenets of having a conversation on both sides. Uh, so it's just getting started. We haven't really fo fully stood it up yet. We haven't brought any programs to it, but we are moving along with that. And uh, it'll be an institute that uh, uh, I'm very excited about. I think uh, our students will also be excited about the opportunity to attend classes through that institute. And you know, Lee Strang was recently hired by an academic council here at OSU as the executive director of the Intellectual Diversity Center. Um, Strang is a conservative law professor who has supported religious and classical education and anti-abortion initiatives in the past. So why do you think it's important that Strang heads this Intellectual Diversity Center? How will he promote civil discourse at the university? Well, he's a voice. Uh, and remember, he's not necessarily the face of the institute. He'll just lead it and manage it. He'll attract different faculty. Uh, as you point out, he might have some views. Uh, we have people that have opposing views. And uh, those will still have an opportunity to be discussed. Uh, he came highly regarded, uh, went through a very rigorous interview process to include with myself. And I'm really proud that uh, uh, we, we found a world-class uh, academic that's going to start us off on the right foot and developing the uh, Salmon P. Chase Center. Thank you. And then going back to April once more, you mentioned that you didn't have any new debt-free related policies to introduce, like former University President Christina M. Johnson's Scarlet and Gray Advantage Program or the Nebraska Promise, but that you were dedicated to being as affordable as possible. So are there any updates on this front, such as any potential new policies or initiatives to reduce rising tuition costs and associated fees? So as we develop the strategy and we roll this thing out uh, at my investiture, we will start to discuss detailed initiatives that will go after things like affordability, accessibility, student success. Uh, I've done some look into some of our, our programs. I mean, I'm really proud to say that 62% of our students today receive some sort of aid towards helping them reduce the cost of the total cost of attendance here. Um, we are moving in the right direction and removing uh, debt for students that graduate here. Um, I'm, I'm proud to say that 56% of our graduates, I talked about this at the State of the University address, leave here debt free at the undergraduate level. That's 20% better than the national average and that's up uh, about 10% from uh, just over about seven or eight years ago. 
uh, those that leave with debt, and that doesn't include those that left with zero debt, leave with an average of about $24,000 in debt. That's also 20% better than the national average. So we're doing some things well, and we are on the right trajectory. I'd like us to do better. Uh, I'd like to look at uh, some of our students that are from the middle income range uh, and what we can do there. But we've still got a little, little more work to do to see what we can do. Um, but I'm excited about the future and trying to reduce debt as, as best we can. Great. And then after the, the United States Supreme Court decision striking down affirmative action in June of 2023, um, the university said it will make any changes necessary to continue to follow all state and federal laws regarding admissions. Um, following this change, universities across the country have seen a fall in admissions from marginalized groups with the New York Times reporting multiple institutions having a drop in admissions for black and Hispanic students. Um, has Ohio State seen a decline in diverse admissions considering this is historically the largest class ever admitted? So as, uh, as you've already reported on, you've heard me talk about uh, from the spring through the summer, uh, we entertained 80,000 applications, 80,000 applications, 40,000 out of state, 40,000 in state, Ohio. Uh, those numbers are records. Uh, but by the law in the Supreme Court ruling, we cannot ask uh, you know, nationality uh, within those uh, applications. So we will have some data once we get the numbers and uh, you know, the September 15th report, which will come out on September 17th, will report the size of the class. We'll have some information on that. I don't have any details on what that impact is. If any, I've read the national trends. Um, what I would say, though, is as I walk around the Oval and I see our campus, we are an incredibly diverse campus. Uh, I do know that students that uh, list themselves with having any level of disability, the numbers of students that are applying and getting in here, those numbers are on the rise. Uh, veterans who come here are also on the rise. Students who are married and have children, those are on the rise. Students that are first generation are on the rise. These are all other categories that are sometimes left out of these other discussions about who's part of our population here. So if you're coming to this campus and wondering whether you're a fit here, just walking around and seeing who's here, we are an incredibly diverse campus just by the eyeball look, let alone if you look in and look into the details. So I'm excited about what I see, uh, and I want to make sure that we continue to welcome students from all walks of life to come here. Thank you. So in August, the Board of Trustees voted to increase your base salary by 3.5% and also presenting you with an annual performance award of $164,368. Uh, there are some critics of this decision by the Board who feel this money doesn't reflect what you've accomplished in your time here so far. So what do you have to say to those who believe this race, raise and bonus was not yet deserved? Well, the first thing I want them to know is I didn't ask for that. So that's my first reaction. The second is, uh, this is what's in my contract. So they have to review my contract. They have to look at what my peers are doing. And I have a performance uh, measure in there that is 30% allowed on my base, that they is very metricized and that it shows performance uh, in there. And they do a very long, exact review. And that's been published, what they, they came out of that. So, you know, <laughs> It's a little humbling for me because I didn't come here for the money. I come here for the mission. Um, I'm somebody that served in uh, uniform for 38 years, so it wasn't like I made a lot of money most of my life. And uh, it is a little embarrassing personally to have to read that in the paper, but you know, my, I live a very public life now, so I know there's critics out there and I, and I, understand, I understand that. Those, those are big numbers and I get that. Um, I'll also say, and I don't, talk about this in any detail, but I also donate a fair bit of money back to the university, and I'm a regular um, contributor to that. Thank you. And then at this year's convocation ceremony, you stated that this year's incoming class, as we discussed, is going to be quite large, um, north of 9,000 undergraduate freshmen, um, which could be the largest in university history. And according to previous Lantern reporting, Ohio State has given second year students the uncharacteristic opportunity to live off campus this academic year. And many Ohio State community members have expressed their worries about dorm overcrowding via social media. So what are some steps the university has taken to accommodate the sizable class and smoothly integrate it into Ohio State's pre-existing student body? Yeah. 
Well, the one thing that I don't think has been all that widely reported, so I'm glad to have the opportunity. You know, we've graduated bigger numbers. Uh, we didn't have as many incoming freshmen uh, come in last year as we'd planned for. There was a little more what they call summer melt. So that's the concept of students saying, hey, I'm coming. I accept the, uh, the admission. I even put money down for a dorm room, but then they don't come because they pick someplace else. Uh, we made a larger number of offers early in the year to make sure that we got the target numbers that we were going to have. That happened even before I got here. Uh, what was different this year is fewer people didn't change their mind coming here. The good news is uh, the work done by Student Life and our admissions people was exceptional. So they were out in front of this, knowing that we were probably going to have a larger class coming in, uh, and we were able to offset that by asking some number of sophomores if they would volunteer and be willing to live in a different type of campus situation, that someplace that we contracted. And a lot of them took us up on that. And everything I've heard and seen is they're very happy with what they've got. Um, we're also very fortunate that we can configure our dorm rooms to handle larger crowds of incoming students. So we're a little bit above the target number, admittedly. Um, but it's an exciting time. Here, here's the one thing that's kind of interesting. We have the most amount of meal plans ever signed up for here on campus in our history. Over 18,500 people are on a meal plan. So uh, as I get around campus, and I was there for move-in day, I was with a lot of parents. I was in a lot of different dorms. Uh, not only was the move-in super smooth and great, uh, the morale of everybody, the attitude of everybody was super positive. So how are dining services kind of handling that influx of students using the you know dining uh, places on campus? Again, we anticipated this. We've been hiring more students to work at our dining facilities. And you know, the one thing that most senior administrators and even our student life sometimes forget when you know there's going to be a little bit more is managing the trash. And we actually anticipated that. We have been in front of that. So hopefully you're not seeing a lot of excess trash because we're do, we are serving more meals. We've actually tried to think through all those things. Thank Important you. part of student life. All right, switching over to what will probably be our last question of the interview, but transitioning into the realm of athletics. Ryan Day has been Ohio State football's head coach for five seasons, with his current record as head coach standing at 55 wins and eight losses. But for the past three years, Day has failed to secure a win against the University of Michigan, which is obviously Ohio State's biggest rival. And there have been many rumors circulating online alleging this year could mark Day's last chance, meaning he will be let go if the Buckeyes lose another matchup. In your view, is there any legitimacy to this idea, or is this unsubstantiated gossip? Well, first of all, I, I will say it's gossip. I don't know where that comes from. I've certainly never said that. I'll tell you what I have said publicly, and I'll say the same thing to you. I have total trust and confidence uh, in Ryan Day. He's an outstanding coach. Those numbers you just spoke to, he's the winningest coach in, in the Big Ten, and one of the winningest coaches, and I, don't, I might have my history wrong, in the history of Ohio State. Um, it's one game at a time. I love the way he's got the team prepared. We've seen some really good performance. It's early. It's a very long season. You know, this is a season like college athletics in Division I football and the Big Ten has never seen in the past because of the college football playoff. So let's enjoy game by game. This is the one thing that unites everybody, not only on this campus, but throughout the entire state of Ohio. So I'm really excited for our football season, and I'm excited for what Coach Ryan Day is doing. 